Hello ladies, welcome to another ladies Bible study. We're going to be covering James chapter 3, the first 12 verses. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this marvelous letter that you inspired in James to write to the early church that has so ministered to us. It's so full of so many good insights and, and concepts and challenges. And so Lord, I pray that you'd help us to settle our hearts. I need you to fill me afresh with your spirit, that you would speak through me, teach through me, that our hearts would be open to what you have for us in a way that, that brings about change, as well as really helps us to tune into the mind of Christ in us, that our words would be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, that we might encourage those who hear all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the book of James is just so full of such practical teaching. And I just, I just love it. I love teaching it. And I know that I'm getting a lot of good feedback from you folks. And um, we're going to look at a very familiar text. And we're going to look about the, at the taming of the tongue. And uh, it's just such good practical stuff. So let's dig in. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter or greater, a greater judgment. Why? What? I mean, shouldn't we all want to be able to teach? I remember way back, uh, and I can thank my youth pastor for this, but um, I don't think he's going to watch this. So, so Phil Myers, thank you uh, for instilling in me a passion for the Word of God and an earnest desire to teach myself, to dig in, to not be dependent upon somebody teaching me. I needed to learn how to study the Word for myself. But... I do know the Lord has given me a spiritual gift to teach, and I enjoy doing it. I love it. I love teaching God's Word. So I know that because I have been given these gifts and developed these skills by the grace of God, I am held to a stricter standard by Him, but also by you folks. Okay? Um, one of the most popular words thrown out there about the church is it's full of hypocrites. Well, what does that mean? Well, it goes back to that old Greek standard of, you know, these actors would put a face on and then they'd act out the scene. They literally put a face over themselves and they'd act out the scene and then the face would come off. You'd see the real person. And so, so many people are really engaged in a form of hypocrisy. They, they teach the word, but they don't live the word. And, and he goes on and he talks about that. He says, look, this is, this is a strict standard. It is something to be entered into with a great deal of awareness and trepidation that there is a standard. If you're going to teach something, you better live it. Okay? So in verse 2, he, he talks about that. He says, look, we all stumble. We all stumble in many ways, including teachers. There are plenty of times when I have not lived up to the standard of what I teach because I'll, I'll live out of my imposter self. I'll dip into the flesh and react in the flesh. Um, and that's where grace comes in, and we need to give each other grace when that happens. And that's why we teach grace, because there isn't a single one of us that lives a perfect life and always does what we teach. Same thing with parents and kids. The kids will see the parents set a standard, but then they'll not live that standard. And they're like, but you said, you know, and they'll hold them to account, hold the feet to the fire. Beloved, hold my feet to the fire. If I am not living what I'm teaching, lovingly, graciously come to me, ask for permission to correct. Okay, if I feel that I'm safe in that relationship with you, and I'll give you that permission to correct me. Okay, if you're going to come at me with, with venom, no, I'm not going to listen to you. Okay, but if you're going to come at me with grace and compassion, knowing that, you know, you probably struggle in the same areas, I'm going to hear what you have to say. Okay, so we all stumble in many ways. And he says, if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Perfect? What does he mean by that? Well, it can be translated complete. It can be, I, I prefer the translation of mature, fully grown, uh, fully developed. Okay. Um, it is one of the, the marks for emotional and spiritual maturity to be able to bridle the tongue. And he is going to um, launch into a couple of illustrations here. But if his basic essence of what he's saying is that maturity is marked. Maturity is marked by not stumbling in what you say. So if you control your words, 
You control your whole body as well. You control your whole life as well. You control your whole essence as well. The tongue reflects a certain element of our essence. And as I was studying this, it threw me to uh, another text in the book of Luke. And it's Luke chapter 6, verse 45. And this is part of Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, okay? And it's something that Jesus said that has always stuck with me. And, it, you know, my memory has it pretty much in this translation, the Robin translation. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if your heart is connected to the Lord, and we're thinking with the mind of Christ, that very essence of our heart, the very life source within us, will be reflected by what we say. Okay? And, you know, you can, you can evaluate where your words are. If they, are they angry? Or is it righteous indignation? Or is it just somebody blocking your goal and you're being selfish? You know, are you letting careless words slip? I've been known to do, especially in traffic, to say things that aren't kind to other drivers. I admit it. Yes. Um, we all can get frustrated with people, key people in our life. Um, there's a key person that I've been connected with. I'm not, uh, he could be watching this, so I'm going to be careful. Um, there are many times where I have checked myself in frustration, um, and just reminded myself how much I care about this person. You know, I'm constantly, and those who've been with me, um, know how many times I'll just repeat it over and over myself to remind myself how much I care about this person, as opposed to, to push away the frustration in that moment. Okay. Um, beloved, take time to ask the Holy Spirit, show me, am I being careless with my words? You know, are you careless with your words to the people that you love the most? How about your kids when they frustrate you? Are you tempted to launch a, a, a derogatory comment or a derogatory nickname that will wound them? You don't intend it to wound them. You know, I can, I can point to certain things in my past where my parents were careless in the words they didn't know that they were hitting the mark and creating a wound. And, you know, the enemy took advantage of it. Now, I'm not trying to create anxiety for you folks as parents. I'm just saying that when you live out of the life source of Christ, the mind of Christ within you, your words will reflect that. When you're living out of the imposter self, the flesh, your words will reflect that. Okay? And so James is saying that maturity in Christ... Those who understand Christ as life are going to speak differently than those who don't. And so he talks about this illustration, um, and it fits with me. But I, I got to thinking, okay, yeah, I'm a horse person. Grew up with horses. Bits, bridles, reins, all of that resonates with me, me because I was riding a horse before I was riding a bike. I was riding a horse before I was walking. Somebody held me on there. Trust me, probably, but as soon as I could sit up, I was on the back of a horse. So he uses the illustration of the bits and steering the horse. Okay, and that's really what the bit is about. It creates pressure in their mouth, gets their attention. Using the reins, go this way, go that way. Horses are big. And I can honestly tell you, you can have a bit in the horse's mouth and always going to go where you want it to go. Been there, done that. Okay, so the reality is his point is, why would he use horses? Because that was a mode of transportation. That was a frequent mode of transportation in where he was living, okay? So that bit is a small piece, usually maybe about six inches across, that's controlling a very large animal with a strong will, okay? Very small piece steers the strong-willed horse. It brings them under submission, brings them under the will of the rider, okay? So the next illustration, um, that he points to is the whole ship thing. Another very common mode of transportation in James's day. They didn't have cars. They had horses, camels, and their feet, and ships. Okay, there might have been carts around there, but something pulling the cart, most likely a donkey. And trust me, they're more stubborn than horses. So, anyway, so you've got a ship being steered by a small rudder. Okay? Relatively, but in proportion to the to the ship, it is a small piece. Okay, but the pilot is steering, imposing his will on the rudder. 
okay? So he's using, in that day, you know, when you, when you go to Jerusalem and you go out to the Sea of Galilee, you know, it's a relatively, it's just a, a like a long stick that reaches up from the rudder and the, the pilot of the boat is turning it right and left, okay? Steering, steering the ship in that manner. It's a small piece of wood, all things considered proportionally with the rest of the ship. But because that pilot has engaged with it, it is steering the ship, even in the middle of a storm. In the middle of a storm, it's, the rudder is all the more important because you're dropping the sails. In most cases, I'm not a sea person, sailor person, so I could be really wrong on this. But it's my understanding that the, the sails would have to come down in large measure and, and you know, the, the, the waves would take the ship. I know there's a certain person out there. I don't think he watches this. So, you know, he could, he could t certainly correct me in that. But nevertheless, the whole point is it's a small piece steers the ship even in the middle of a storm. So, beloved, when storms hit, we don't get a pass for what we say. In fact, all the more important for us to be guiding our thoughts, guiding our words by keeping our heart, that seed of life, coming from the Lord Jesus as opposed to our flesh. Okay? So, as he goes on, he starts to put in some application here to his illustrations. So, in verse 5, he says, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. The tongue really is small compared to the rest of the body. Okay, really small. But it can talk really big, really big. It can boast, it can exaggerate, it can lie, it can say mean and hurtful things. And it can set ablaze relationships without any problem. How great a small fire, how great a fire, excuse me, can be set off by just a spark, just a word, just a careless word. You know that old adage that we don't hear it much anymore because people have finally figured out it's not true. That sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That is just pure malarkey, okay? Words pierce the soul, especially if they're spoken by someone who we really connect with, who we're really looking to for affirmations and acceptance. You know, I mentioned earlier, yeah, sure, my parents at times had some careless words and they wounded me, okay? Every parent will go through that. Friends, careless words. Colleagues, fr careless words. I remember um, at one point in a professional relationship, a work relationship, uh, there was a gentleman I worked with, and he was like an older brother to me, and um, that meant we were very rough with our words at first. And um, there was a point where, you know, yeah, I was trying to bust on him. He would bust back on me, and, and these words were getting a little bit out of control. It was getting, it wasn't hurtful because I knew who I was in Christ, but nevertheless, the Spirit of the Lord convicted me and said, Robin, you need to speak with grace. You need to knock off this banter that you think is fun and funny and you know you're pushing his buttons, you know you're annoying. I never wanted to hurt with my words, I just wanted to annoy, just wanted to make him scream. I accomplished that a few times and then the Lord was like, hey, you know, that's not a good example in the setting that you're in especially and you know better. And so I had to go to him and we had a discussion and we both agreed we had to speak better to one another. As much fun as the annoying each other was, we had to speak better to one another. And that has stuck with me and carried with me in future work relationships. Um, and one even that I'm in right now that I know I have to watch my words. I need to build up. I need to encourage, not tear down. As much as I want to bust on that person, I know I need to be careful. Because um, I also know he's very, very good. In fact, he warned me today how good he is at retaliation. Anyway, the tongue is a fire, beloved, and we need to be careful that we're not setting fires in our relationships. He goes on, he says, the tongue is a fire, the world, the very world of iniquity. Hmm, iniquity, iniquity. So we've got the fire theme going on. We've got iniquity. What does that mean? 
It, it takes me to the text in First uh, Samuel, Second Samuel. One of them, where um, Saul has not carried out Samuel's instructions to the letter. In fact, um, what he was supposed to kill, he didn't kill. And he had all kinds of excuses for it. And Samuel replied to him and said that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and iniquity in the heart. Iniquity is as insubordination in the heart. Say no to a direct order of the Lord. Iniquity is choosing to go against God's directive. So in other words, you know what he wants you to do, but you choose not to. Okay? And it makes me also think about, uh, oh, this would be a nice tangent. Um, in Genesis chapter 6, uh, these angelic entities, these created entities, known as the Watchers, decided to commit iniquity. They chose against God, and they descended on Mount Hermon, and they set up their own divine council, and then they looked upon the daughters of men, and they went into them, and they produced offspring. This is what we call iniquity. They committed iniquity. They went directly against the command of God. They rebelled against Him. They're all intertwined. Rebellion and iniquity are intertwined. Okay, and so it's the tongue that sets fire, a very world of iniquity. The tongue says, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to follow God's directive. I'm going to say what I want to say instead of submitting my words to the very life of Christ in me. And it sets things aflame and it brings about rebellion and defiance and really bad consequences. The tongue, he goes on and he says, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. It is not just an isolated defilement. It defiles our very essence, body, soul, and spirit. When we engage in things that are from our flesh instead of from the very heart and life of God within us. And so, beloved, it is, it is critical that we maintain our awareness of our life source being Jesus, engaging him, saying, Lord, I need you to speak through me. You know, when I'm in a counseling session, I'm chronically just crying out to the Lord, I need you to speak through me. When I'm dealing with people around me or I'm at Walmart, oy, dealing with the people at the checkout situation or Ah, uh, there's just so many opportunities as you, as you look around and engage with people. And it's not so much now that we're under quarantine because I'm not out that much. But still, when you're engaging with people in any kind of form of conversation, Lord, I need you to speak through me. Establish my thoughts with your thoughts, your words with your words, that they might have grace, that it might give grace to those who hear. So he goes on and he says, and, and not only does it impact the entire body, but it sets the sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Woo that's some serious stuff. The tongue can defile our entire essence. It can set our life course. Words that we say can impact the very direction of our life. And it's it's tantamount to the fire from hell. The watchers, these guys that rebelled against God, their only option, their end result is going to be the lake of perdition, the fires of hell. I am not, beloved, I am not saying that I can lose my salvation. What I am saying is that that course of life for me, I want it to line up with God's path for me, not with the enemy's path. Okay, I don't want it to result in robbing me of eternal treasure. I want it to result in producing life, not the flames of fire. In other words, the source of the words is these negative words, these words that are contrary to God's purpose and plan and the life and essence of Christ, the very source of them is the power of sin, motivated by the enemy himself. You've heard me talk many times about the nature of spiritual warfare. The most typical form of spiritual warfare, beloved, is not some weirdness out here, which I've seen plenty of, but the real stuff that happens more times than not, day in, day out, takes place right up here through the power of sin which dwells in the members of my body. It's no longer my commanding officer. You've heard me rant on that plenty of times. 
is not my commanding officer, but because it still resides in me like a splinter, it has the capacity to interject thoughts, first person singular, my tone of voice. Okay, it sounds like me. doesn't sound like a deep, snarling demon. It will interject thoughts, first person singular, and it will tempt, accuse, and deceive. Its goal is to get me to act out of my imposter life, not the real me. The real me is in Christ. The imposter is tuned into the flesh, the old version of me in Adam, which I've died to. Okay, I'm dead to it. But there's this imposter through the flesh that says, hey, do the old way, learn, go tap into the flesh. The flesh are the default ways of dealing with, with life, trying to get the feel goods in, love me, accept me, keep the feel bads out. These are patterns that I learn and I carry them with me into my walk with the Lord. And I need to learn to put them off by putting on the mind of Christ. When I begin to understand how much he loves and accepts me, I don't have to hook into God. I simply rest and receive. As I learn to rest in all that I have in him already, the very life of Christ flows in me and then through me to the people around me. My words will be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt. It will give grace to those who hear. Now, if I fly through life in my default settings, trust me, I'm not going to say words of grace. I'm going to say words that are motivated by selfishness. Okay, so this is the heartbeat of what we teach here at Exchange Life Ministries. This is the heartbeat of the journey tools. Um, I'm not going to launch into that, but if, you know, please, you want to learn how to tame your tongue, how to bring it under control, how to function with the mind of Christ, give me a call. We're all about teaching this stuff in a practical day in, day out basis. So he, the next thing he launches into is this comparison and contrast. So he starts into a comparison here in verse 7. He says, every species or every nature or kind of animal or bird or reptile, creatures of the sea, can be tamed. Even whales, orcas, we've seen that killer whales been tamed. Okay, um, reptiles, I, yeah, people have them as pets, not me, but people have them as pets. Birds have been kept as pets. Uh, every kind of animal, okay, has been kept as a pet has been tamed by humans. But the one thing that hasn't been tamed by the humans is our tongue. It's very rare to meet someone who has truly done that. Um, our tongue is a restless evil in our flesh. It's full of deadly poison. It speaks death, not life, when left unchecked. When we learn to tame it and bring it under the will of God and from the very life of God, that's when it's tamed. That's when we'll be speaking life instead of death. So, beloved, ask the Holy Spirit to speak life through you to those around you. Not death, but life. Okay? I'm not trying to get into the power of positive thinking. What I am saying is we need to speak life. We need to speak positively to one another. If you find yourself becoming a negative Nelly, you're constantly rehearsing and speaking out what's wrong, Ask the Holy Spirit to tell you, stop, when you get in that mode, and then shift over to speaking the mind of Christ and saying, okay, show me what's right. Help me to speak what's right. You can learn to do that. You can choose to do that. Okay? It takes practice. I can, I can testify to that because in my flesh, I'm very negative. I'm going to see what's wrong instead of what I see what's right. I'm going to see what's driving me nuts instead of what I appreciate about someone. And I have to purposefully set my mind what I appreciate about the person or appreciate about the situation or what's positive to overcome that urge of the flesh to spout off on what's negative. All right, he goes on in this comparison. He shifts now to a contrast. He says, but no one, excuse me, all right, all right I covered verse 8, but, but no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison with it. Here's the contrast. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Wow, how's that for a contrast? You know, with it we bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that was within me. Bless His holy name. And then we turn around and curse the ones who bear His image. Yes, beloved, that's what it means to be made in the likeness of God. We are His image bearers. When we curse someone... 
we're cursing God. Why? Because every human on the face of the planet, even those who've sold their souls to the devil, believe it or not, still bears the image of God. They masked it, maybe, and hidden it really well, but they bear the image of God. And so when we curse them, we're cursing God, the one whose image they bear. It is very important. This is why the Lord Jesus says, bless those who curse you. You know, when you get cursed, bless them back. You know, bless your enemies. Pray for them. Why? They bear the image of God. It is not because they deserve it. It is simply because they bear the image of the one we're created in the likeness of. And we're followers of Jesus Christ. We need to bless, not curse. It's challenging. It's definitely a mark of maturity because there are definitely people in this world that I would have and do have a very hard time saying blessings over, okay? So from there he goes on and he talks about the fact that, look, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. It needs to change. We need to engage the Holy Spirit in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to speak life over people instead of death. He goes on and, and he, he, he jumps into another illustration. Okay, in the spring or the fountain. This would, whoa, there's my spelling. Okay, the spring of water. Okay. And in that day, you know, you didn't have a water fountain that you could walk up to and just push the bar and boom, water comes out. This is a, um, a spring um, that was very vital to these communities that had these fresh water springs. We think about Israel journeying through the wilderness and how critical it was that the Lord would bring forth water. When Moses spoke to the rock and struck the rock, and I'm not going to launch into the symbolism there, but this is what we're talking about these these springs of water and his point is they can't bring forth both bitter and fresh and he he posits the question does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water okay no it doesn't and in the same way he talks about a fig tree and an olive tree I don't know why they translated it vine. The only olives I've ever, I could be really wrong. I'm not an olive expert, but the olive tree, the olive, the olive trees that I've seen in the garden in Gethsemane, they're trees, not vines. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, even in the current state, go. It's awesome. Um, a fig tree is going to bear figs, not olives. Olive tree is going to bear olives, not figs. Okay. That's the whole point. Even Jesus was bringing this up in, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount. So a lot of what James is, is teaching here is a reflection of what Jesus taught him during that time. And, of course, we also talk about, you know, the, the John 15. You know, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you're going to do what? You're going to bring forth much fruit. So the more we allow the word of God to abide in us, this is the key, folks. This is really the key is finding our life in him, learning day in, day out, moment by moment, to abide in His presence, in the now moments, being aware of Him. And, you know, the, the, the tools that we're teaching in the Journey Tools course, they're phenomenal at helping us do this. Okay, so yes, this is a shameless plug. Um, we are getting ready to roll out some new groups in the Journey Tools. If you're interested in learning more, please contact me. I'll leave it at that. Um, the abiding in Christ, allowing the very life and essence of Christ to flow in us and out of us, instead of functioning in our flesh, instead of functioning in the imposter form, we put on the mind of Christ, the source of life and the source of joy flow freely through us. No one can steal it away unless we let them. And beloved, we don't need to let them. Because when we're resting and receiving all the abundance of our life in Christ, when somebody says snarky things to us, we don't have to fire back. We can simply bless instead of curse because we know how blessed we are in Him. And beloved, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, you know, you, when you return good for evil, it gives God the opportunity to bring that person under conviction. And hopefully under, beyond conviction to repentance, to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And if they already know the Lord Jesus and they're operating in the flesh, conviction to say, hey, I'm sorry I shouldn't have said that. Let's be reconciled. Let's be at peace with one another. 
Okay. So, beloved, this is a powerful text, a very convicting text to all of us. There isn't a one of us that I know that is completely perfect in what we say, but we can grow in it. There's no excuse for us not to endeavor to, to put on the mind of Christ and to live out of his thoughts, out of his heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. We have been given a new heart in Christ Jesus. We need to live out of that heart. Our words will reflect it. We'll speak life to one another. We'll speak words that are filled with grace, seasoned, as it were, with salt. Salt gives life flavor. It gives preservation. It, pres it, it promotes life. It promotes healing. Okay? Salt was a tremendous commodity in, in the New Testament times. It was, it, it was a currency in that time because it was so precious. It had so much... Um, so many uses that were powerful in healing, okay? Pouring salt in the wounds. Why would you do that? It would hurt like crazy, but it was a natural antibacterial. Uh, it cleansed the wound, all of it. So, beloved, when we speak words of grace, it's going to bring healing to those who hear. It'll sustain life. It adds flavor. It's preservation for those who hear it. Okay, so let this challenge you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you on this. And let Him speak through you. Okay, put off the, the flesh, put on the mind of Christ, and He will speak through you words of grace, words of healing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these truths. And Lord, it convicts me. I know I can be very careless at times. And so Lord, help me to be continually growing in the awareness of your presence in my life, how I'm speaking to people, especially the people that I care the most about. And Lord, I just ask that you would establish our thoughts with your thoughts, that our hearts would, would be in tune with yours, that we live out of the heart that you've given us in Christ Jesus, all for your glory this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week. Lord willing, President Trump will end this tyrannical rule of our current governor. Uh, there are rumblings of that on the Facebook. Um, I am hopeful that we'll be back meeting together very soon. Uh, I know other people aren't so hopeful, but hey, I'm going to choose choose the hopeful path here that we're going to get back to normal uh, instead of living under the insanity currently in our culture, in our country. So God bless. Have a great week in Jesus. We'll see you next time.